So the artist and filmmaker of tonight's screening is here, Tara Matic, and um, he's a really important person to me and, and to the world, too. And um, so he's been here on an artist residency, and he made some new work and like showed us like a brand new artist talk last night, and it was really exciting. And I was like, hey, Tara, can we screen toilet training, please? And he obliged. To, to let me screen this tonight. So I'm really glad that you all can be here. Um, you know, it, it is all so accessible online, but it's nice to be together and watch this film. What, what year was it made? 2002. Um, so, I, you know, and I just want to contextualize like my request. Um, and I should also say, you're in the studio for Creative Inquiry. Sign up for our email list. I really want you to come back. Um, I really want you to be involved in being here and also feel supported by this space. Um, but back to tonight, I, I, the toilet training was, um, was made to talk about how restroom access fucking sucks for gender non-conforming people and how, you know, operating in this very binary gendered society that we have, the restroom really becomes this overly policed um, place where people are put in danger by how they are read. And so this isn't a new problem. And, I, and so I wanted to watch this 2002 film all together and then discuss it afterwards um, and, and discuss it in our contemporary moment. Because um, some of us know and some of us might not know, but you will know soon, that um, it's really hard to get all gender restrooms here. I will say we have an all gender restroom right above us. It took a lot of people and a lot of years of, you know, really emotional and, um, you know, frustrating work for, uh, on a lot of people um, to get this fucking bathroom upstairs. And, and it also took, like, multiple attempts. Um, it took people putting themselves in danger um, and their jobs in danger. It took, you know, police showing up and, you know, escorting new gendered signs to put back on it. Like, this has happened, <laughs> and it continues to happen, and it's happening here at CMU. And so this 2002 film hopefully contextualizes some of what we are feeling in our contemporary moment. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all afterwards. It's only 25 minutes, um, you know, so get comfortable, but you don't have to be that comfortable because it's not that long. Um, but yeah, we'll just screen it unless you wanted to say anything and you didn't want anything. We're gonna talk afterwards. All right, thank you. issue about gender seems well represented by the bathroom issue because it shows that those that are even being in perfect compliance with the signs on the door you may have trouble in the bathroom according to how you're perceived by the other people using that bathroom I had problems with restrooms before I began transitioning as a effeminate gay male I was attacked more than once in bathrooms. And we got into town around one in the morning. We stopped in a coffee shop. We uh, went in the bathroom and before I knew it, two guys, one pushed me into the other. One took a couple of swings at me and they blocked the door and uh, said, oh, you're a little faggot. And I made a lot of noise, someone came in and prevented me from being 
hurt badly. So it becomes more than just a matter of, I want to use this bathroom or another bathroom. In my case, a, an effeminate guy, they felt they could get away with doing whatever they wanted to. And they probably could have. <laughs>
So I love New York because people are real. You know right away if they like you, you know if they don't. Well, I found out that I'm not very well liked at this pier. Hey, let me tell you the story. It all happened. One afternoon, I walked into the women's restroom not too far from where we're standing now. I walked into this restroom here. It says women. Okay, I'm a woman. I'm standing in the mirror, primping, getting cute, honey. When I hear, bleep, 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 come out of the restroom, I'm like, they can't be talking about me. What's going on outside? Lo and behold, the officer comes up to the door of the women's restroom. Come out of the restroom. No drag queens and transgenders allowed in the restroom. I would definitely have to say the African-American transgenders when they go into the restroom, they're the first ones approached. Because, I, I mean, I've witnessed it for myself. They're the first ones being approached and harassed or obscenities being shouted at. So I came out. I'm like, what the hell? These girls were, you know, being harassed by the guards. They wouldn't let them in. They were yelling for the other ones to get out. Based on an assumption, you're going to tell me I can't use the restroom because you think I'm not a female? Every transgender man, every transgender woman, that comes to this facility should be able to use the restroom. People have a concern oftentimes that sexual violence will occur if men and women use bathrooms that are not um, segregated. The question of women's vulnerability because of their gender is a much broader question. Bathroom safety is just one aspect of that. I think that the, the thinking that gender segregated bathrooms uh, keeps people from uh, engaging in sexual assault against women doesn't really comport with what we know about sexual assault and what we know about rape and violence in our society against women. Um, for one thing, I think sometimes it's premised on the idea that if men are in a bathroom with women, they won't be able to help themselves. And I think that that's certainly a, a sexist and outdated idea about what rape is. Um, I think that we no longer believe that rape is excusable because men can't help themselves. Women uh, who have often themselves been the target of uh, violence and assault need, need safety. When you mark a W or an M on a bathroom door, it does not function as a lock. If you create a woman's space and, 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 and give the illusion of safety, then if someone is a predator, they certainly know where to look. The real question, if we're going to try and talk about safety, um, would not be a bathroom that was gendered, but a bathroom that you completely controlled. If what we were most concerned about was making sure that a pr no one was vulnerable to attack, then what we'd do is construct bathrooms where people had complete control over the space. Meaning, you could open a door and walk in and close the door and lock it and you wouldn't share it with anybody else. It's always interesting to me how it gets displaced into a question of assault because it puts one group of people that are oppressed against another group of people that are oppressed. And frankly, to me, they look like they should be allies. And bathroom safety should be something that women most understand someone needing precisely because of the role it's often played in women's lives. The issue of bathroom access becomes more complicated when people have intersecting, visibly intersecting identities that um, become a, uh, that, that also raise a level of scrutiny one might undergo. So someone who's homeless, um, a person of color, um, youth, are already under a higher level of scrutiny in our culture. And when you add a trans identity or a gender different identity or gender queer identity to that, it's just raising the bar one more notch. And I think those individuals um, encounter the most uh, scrutiny and I think the most uh, challenges to their use of public facilities. I've done a lot of thinking about disability access to bathrooms as well as trans access to bathrooms. Um, and I'm struck by kind of the most frequent gender non-specific bathrooms are bathrooms marked with the icon of a wheelchair. And on a theoretical level, I think it's really, really, really significant that one of the very few public spaces where the gender binary is broken, it's broken by disability. It becomes really difficult when you have someone who's like doesn't identify with the label on the door um, helping you, and how do you deal with that situation? 
are you ready to enter the bathroom? Like, I've always sort of done this thing where I sort of, if I have somebody who identifies as a bio boy or whatever, I walk in first and say, you know, um, there's a guy coming in here. Does anybody have any serious objections to them coming in and helping me go to the bathroom? It makes everyone uncomfortable, and it's just reminded that, like, you don't fit into this, like, constructive place, you know? Mm -hmm. To be gender non specific doesn't just benefit trans people, it gives everyone more bathroom options. It, it creates more toilets for more people, and that's a good thing. There are places where um, this becomes even more acute and, and actually easier to solve, in a sense, than other places. I, I think that um, tra most trans people work or go to school, um, and it's in those environments where they, they're going to be using the bathroom on a regular basis. There's a lot of awareness about gender at the younger ages and that uh, they really respond to exercises we do that explore what, what people say a real boy is supposed to do or what a real girl is supposed to do. Often young people become targets of uh, harassment very young. And because schools are often neighborhood-based and zone-based, once you become a target, you don't ever lose that label, and so you remain a target through middle school, through high school. I just didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. Um, especially, like, with the bathrooms, like, that's where, like, gender and how my gender identity was different came up. Because I felt like, you know, it didn't really come up in conversation during lunch or, you know, during other times when I could more easily avoid it. Young people often report skipping gym for those very same reasons. Um, I think locker rooms and bathrooms are particularly hyper-gendered places. It's just that I couldn't go into the locker room and I just didn't change for gym. And if you didn't change and get into gym clothes for gym, it's the same thing as not being there. I think a lot of um, our student leaders in school still get a lot of harassment in locker rooms from, um, from their peers. Like, are you looking at me? Or are you checking me out? So I had to go to Washington Irving. It was a school that I went to a lot. I went there for like three semesters. Ever since I was old enough to be in night school, I was in night school. I mean, basically, basically like bathroom access was just another thing that I had to deal with on top of everything. It just made me... It just gave me another reason to not come to school that would make my life easier, you know? If I was gonna cut out because I wasn't happy with my life being trans and because I was getting harassed everywhere else anyway, that, you know, like this is just one more thing that I didn't have to deal with if I wasn't here. I was afraid that if I went to a boys' bathroom, I would get beat up. I was afraid that if I went to a female bathroom, that would that would put me down, tell me what I'm doing here, you know, you're a guy, you don't need to be in the female bathroom. Not only it, it, it's, it's not safe for me, but it's embarrassing. It's very, very embarrassing. Such as people are looking, and you know, it, it, to me, it lowers my self-esteem down, you know? The bathroom issue really sticks out as a key barrier to them to going to school, attending school, feeling comfortable at school. Um, I've talked with a number of the clients about just how they feel they have to hide to go to the bathroom. They don't feel comfortable and they'll hold it in all day. Um, they'll be really duplicitous and cloak and dagger just to use the bathroom. I'm not as asking for a special trans bathroom, no. You know? I just want to be able to be comfortable in the bathroom using, be safe. They told me that I could use the bathroom in the lab, but the, that bathroom was often closed, so you know, so nothing was really resolved, you know. So that's the reason I left the school because I, I was tired of them not doing anything about the bathroom issue and about me being safe in the school. I identify as a butch lesbian, and I think anybody who's different feels uncomfortable in bathrooms. All first grade, I went to the boys' bathroom, and no one corrected my behavior. Nobody really said anything. And as a result, 
I ended up using the boys' bathroom all year long. Because that's where all the people that were dressed like me were going to the bathroom. Just made perfect sense. Second grade rolls around, and I'm told that I need to go use the girls' bathroom. So I go to use the girls' bathroom. And the girls in the bathroom tell me I'm not supposed to be there. I don't belong there. I, I should leave. So I showed them my underwear thinking that that would convince them that I was a girl. Like, what boy? I mean, I knew at the time no boy would wear girls' underwear. What boy wears girls' underwear? That should be convincing enough. And it wasn't convincing. And they threw me out. And I, had, I went back to my teacher and I cried. She took me down to the bathroom and explained to the girls that I had a right to be there, that I was a girl, that it was OK that I was there. I think the, the young people who are most targeted are those who fit the least in society's norms. I recall not using the bathroom very much that year. <laughs> that whole year, I had stomach problems. My mother had to put me on this high fiber diet and I had to be like all, I was all, I'm just a mess. And it was all because, probably all because of this bathroom stuff. things that really concerns me is that um, I think that there's a lot of health uh, consequences to what we see happening with our clients. Um, people are not using the bathrooms in their schools, they're not being able to use the bathrooms at their offices, and they can't use bathrooms publicly. So what you see is people not using the bathroom when they need to. And um, anecdotally, I've definitely seen in trans communities that people have a lot of health problems related to that. Everyone knows that the healthy way to deal with going to the bathroom is to use the bathroom when you need to. And when that is not possible for transgender people, uh, we see health problems in our community. I did not go to college. I dropped out of high school. I'm sure that my gender problems were a part of the reason why I dropped out of high school. And as a result, I've ended up with jobs like this. It still affects me to this day. You know, it's never not affected me. Those three, those are like formative years of learning and like growing. And those are, that's the, my bathroom experience. You can see over time, it's just depressing to be at work, to be at school, to, to have this pressing biological function and you're afraid someone's gonna see you. Am I gonna have to wait till there's no one in the hallway? The entire situation is anxiety provoking. The entire situation can, it's damaging over time, it's damaging. Well, when I first started transitioning from male to female, I wasn't, um, I was pretty uncomfortable using restrooms in the college. And in fact, I didn't want to go, well, I certainly didn't want to go in a men's room. That would be ridiculous. And I wasn't at all comfortable going into the women's restroom. When this happens in a workplace, there may be a very valued, valued employee, but people are very confused by what's going on. So I did a search of the campus and discovered in the nurse's office there were single stall bathrooms, um, which are the, you know, for someone who's transgender, those are the bathrooms that are the easiest to deal with. It had a lot of inconveniences because you can only use it when the nurse's office was unlocked. There are a lot of people who are transitioning gender who have a fairly extended period often of not appearing or not being perceived to be either gender. Then I reached the point where I became comfortable enough that I would go into um, the, the more public restrooms uh, on campus. And uh, that seemed to work pretty well. And then one of my colleagues who was in my department, another professor, um, went to the academic vice president and said, I was going in the bathrooms and the academic vice president, she says, well, where else is she supposed to go? Because there's so little understanding of uh, gender diversity that um, HR directors and managers and people who are working with transgender and other people are really at a loss to know what's going on.
unfortunately, um, even in situations where we have uh, good anti-discrimination laws that cover gender identity, we see people losing in court when they go to challenge their rights to access a sex-segregated facility like a bathroom. So you look at the case of Julie Goines um, in uh, Minnesota, and she was living in one of, at the time, only three states that had gender identity protection um, in its anti-discrimination law. I had my supervisor's boss come up to me and say that we need to go down to Human Resources because the Human Resources Department wanted to know which washroom I should use. I'm just looking at him like, what are you talking about? When she challenged her inability to use a women's bathroom um, at her employer, uh, West Publishing Group, she ultimately lost in court at the highest level in the Minnesota State Supreme Court. So overall, we just sort of see that this is a source of enormous violence and um, discrimination and fear um, in our clients' lives and really restricts their ability to participate equally in employment, education, the use of public space, um, it just feels as though it's sort of it's one of this, these major obstacles in our clients' lives that a lot of people don't even recognize as being a serious issue. It's, not, it's something that's so fundamentally under-discussed in our culture. It is in an employer's best interest to have people feeling safe and secure and comfortable in the work environment. And having a gender neutral bathroom is often one of the sort of mo it's such a concrete piece of infrastructure that is welcoming for trans people. That is one of the things that clients have pointed out is that we have degendered bathrooms here and how they feel they feel comfortable coming here using the bathroom. My hope here is that people can learn from our experience. We got together as an office, we had training sessions, and then we also had discussions on alternatives. We educated people, and what we did was we have all gender bathrooms. We have had, we have had no problem, and I can't see why every office doesn't do the same thing. Put it in another bathroom. <laughs> Make people happy. happy. Happy workers are productive workers, and so um, I don't think that there needs to be much of an argument around that. Party with the best. No more diapers to get in her way. We are very impressed. She is a super duper pooper. She knows when she has to go. Take a bow. She's a big girl now. She's the best pooper we know. I'll start with a question to break the ice, but then start passing the mic around. Um, I guess my first question is like, well, it's twofold. When was the last time you saw this? And also, like, watch it all the way through. And also, like, how does it feel watching something from 2002 age, but also, like, not a age? 
I can't remember the last time I watched this. I, it's maybe 10 years. Um, my mom just watched this and was like, Dramatic, do you know? And she happened to know the professor in that. And I was like, oh, I should watch that again. Um, that was just like a month ago. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> but what, how do I feel about it being relevant and 20 years ago? Um, Well, when I made it, I didn't think I would be sitting here today talking about the same thing at CMU. And um, it's a little defeating. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, but I'm glad there's a tool to start the conversation. I should say this, too. Uh, when I was asked to make this, I was asked that it be a training tool for schools and employment and that it also be able to work the documentary circuit. Um, so it had a very intention, it had intention. So I, it was, it was for schools and businesses. Um, it's awkward to watch something you made 20 years ago, but that's not, <laughs> that's not why I feel awkward. The, yeah. the bathroom stuff is not why I feel awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, I don't, I, I have mixed feelings about it. And I mean, I should also say, this screening is also, and I should have said this at the top, is also funded by University Health Services at CMU and the Center for DEI. Um, and so, you know, it it is also funded by these educational institu institutions within our institution in order for us to, you know, talk about this right now. Um, but I, the other thing I wanted to ask is like. Um, we, we, you kind of talked about this before privately with me, and I'm, I'm not going to go into everything, but I also wonder, like, what would be, what would be your dream, like, sequel to this? Oh, yeah. Uh, access to health care. Access to health care for trans people. And then, um, then I'd like to do one for housing. Um, I don't know. Just, like, I just can't, I, there's, there's never-ending topics for mm -hmm. us to explore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did see access to health care as a as the immediate sequel to this mm -hmm. because in part the physical problems that manifest when we mental and, and physical things that happen when we're not able to access bases that we need to use for biological functions I can attest to that yes. <laughs> um, anyone want to ask a question or share if they want to share. I guess I have a question yeah, you for have a you. Question? Like it, uh, it is, it was 2003, I think, now. Because uh, there was a, the first one was like, ding, ding, 2003. And I was like, well, it couldn't have been 2002 that I made this. So, but how does it resonate with you all? Um, and it's not made, well, it's not made for us, but it's about us. So how is it for you who identify as trans or gender nonconforming, how do you feel watching it? And mind you, it was 20 years ago and there was so limited access and all those middies are so hard to listen to. I but love the middies. You do? I guess oh. it actually does situate it when it happened. Oh, yeah. yeah. The sound Ooh. effects. Great. Ooh. It was like before YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So how, I guess, what was that? experience and like for you is there something missing i mean i can't i'm not gonna go back and edit it but i'm just kind of thinking like what uh what was that experience like for you looks like it could have been made last week to me oh. and i do wonder what is all the fuss and if you go to france you walk into a, a bathroom and there might be a man standing there peeing while you want to wash your hands and no one says a word that's yeah. the ca it's a town cafe you yeah I mean, I, I can take this opportunity to contextualize like my my own proximity to this and like my like um, what's happening in our contemporary moment. And some as some of you are very well aware, um, but like I guess for for me, like what's missing out of that is like um, the the legal obstacles. Mm -hmm. You know, like like that off that one person who's like, I don't know why every office doesn't just do this. You know, all we did was we met, 
we talked about it, and then we did it, you know? And I mean, I had that naivety myself, you know? I, I started here in 2016, and you know, the first place I had an office was in the basement of Purnell, and there were all these like dressing rooms on the hallway, and then they'd have these single stall restrooms attached to the dressing rooms, and they had a separate door, and but they could be connected, and it, it's this like interesting architectural like, you can pee when you dress into your costume, but you can also just be in the dressing room. And these are also the bathrooms for the basement. So there, there's four single stall restrooms that also have showers. I honestly, that's my like next thing is that every restroom should have a shower. <laughs> but you know, and then like a jacuzzi or something and a sauna. <laughs> but, you know, awesome, perfect. Um, but you know, I, I'm also very into body comfort. But um, the 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 first thing I did was I turned to like the facilities manager and I was like, hey, so these are like gendered, but they really, they really don't need to be. Like, can we just, you know, change those signs? And, you know, shout out to him. He was like, yeah, I don't see why not. And he's like, what kind of signs should we get? And I was like, I'll, I'll order them if you'll put them up. And he's like, okay. And then it was done. It was all over. And then I was like, oh, sweet. I love this place. Like, nice guy. We were done with this in a few days, you know, and then we had all gender restrooms on the basement. And then, you know, that m raised consciousness of like, a lot of other people were looking for those restrooms in the building. And we're like, oh, there's four all gender restrooms in the basement now, you know, and then starting to be like, why aren't they on the third floor where most of the students are? Why aren't they on, you know, the floors where the audience comes and uses the restrooms? And so it started to be spoken about more and more in places that I was and where I wasn't, you know, and so, you know, it, it triggered a lot of conversations and then like drama, we're like a special little island of existence here. And so then at one point, all of the restrooms were turned all gender. And then someone came to a play and complained. And so then like they, they got taken back without telling any, any of the students. And then the students were like, what Hell, you know, and then like then it was like, okay, well, we're gonna keep some and not others, and it's just like there's still to this day kind of a wild and wonderful world of signage in the drama building, and and it's lacking clarity, honestly. But there's still four all gender restrooms in the basement with showers um, <laughs> that have deadbolts, and it's really nice. Highly recommended. They're in use when there's a play happening though because they're dressing rooms um, but you know that also begat more conversations because I got moved out of Purnell and then I was put into Syert and then I was like hey remember when I asked for those bathrooms to be all gender like this is still an issue for me like I I need still a need to go to the bathroom I still I still use bathrooms <laughs> I still have a bladder and I like to drink a lot of coffee um, so I use them a lot and so I had very limited weird access that was very reflected in this where it was like the nurse's office is closed sometimes like the bathroom that I had to use like they were like well it's locked because it's near um, like where all the money is kept at the university and they're like we can give you access but and I was like I don't want access to like where all your money is. I, I see the writing on the walls there. They're like trans person steals money. You know, like I was like, no, no, I'm not doing that. And so then I like, you know, started asking questions and, and you know, I met some friends in the room when I started asking those questions and saying, what, what, help, you know? And, and in asking questions, I met other trans and gender nonconforming people here you know, and started to realize that I wasn't so alone. I met a lot of like students and staff and like, you know, faculty who had tried to get things changed. Shout out to Susie Silver who has asked for this for a very long time in this building specifically. Um, and you know, that, that question ha was not new. My problem wasn't new. Um, I wasn't alone, but I felt very alone and I felt very novel at the time. And, and I just wanna say like, that's the number one like strategy for like oppressing people in need is to make them feel alone and novel and none of you are alone and none of you are novel in your needs so fuck that strategy um and so then it took like a year like it took committees and it took like so many people and it took so long to get this one 
all gender restroom in sight, and now there's an all gender fucking restroom in sight. And you know, I'm just like trying to spread them everywhere I step. <laughs> it's like my strategy. Um, there's one right above us, and you know, like have restroom access spread just by like forcing it everywhere. Um, but I'll say the legal background because I'm just going on a because it's, it's been a journey. Um, the legal background is that the Allegheny County Health Department's plumbing code um, it has a thing about bathrooms and genders. Okay, because um, there's toilets in there. And so the gender in that code is pulled from the international plumbing code, which is this standard. Like there's standards made by all kinds of industries for all kinds of things. Like, HDMI has a standard, you know, like there's standards. And, and so then it's a copy and a paste, and there's a new standard that's made every like three or four years. And, um, and the new standard in 2021 does include code for all gender restrooms. That doesn't copied and pasted in 2021. That's gonna take, a, I think, another year to possibly be copied and pasted, and they don't necessarily copy and paste everything. Um, and so we're in this waiting pa pattern right now, but CMU has to, ha according to many here, and not according to me, has to conform to plumbing code. Um, it is one of the ways that new building permits are issued and like, you know, inspections are passed for those building permits. And if you haven't noticed, I haven't been here a single year that there hasn't been a building being built. I don't know about all of you, but there's always a building bu being built. And so the issue has gone to Allegheny County Health Department, which copies and pastes this from the state plumbing code. Um, and the state plumbing code is like in this very gerrymandered, you know, very Republican like control. So that's where we're at right now in our county is that we're waiting for this magical 2021 pl plumbing code to hopefully just like sneak in, honestly sneak in. Um, and then we hopefully will be able to have multi-stall all gender restrooms, HEMA. That is the plan. That is on the Health and Wellness Center. So assuming the plumbing code stuff goes the way that it, we want it to go, yes. Um, we actually got to work with JSA, um, what's the rest of their name? Yeah, JSA, who was, so an entity, came out of an entity called Stall. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah. Stop. Yeah, a really that's wonderful organ architectural firm. That's so Joel Sanders yeah. Architecture. Joel was a member of a group called Stalled, which also had Susan Stryker on uh, as a member that was the entity, I'm forgetting the lawyers, it's like this tri powerful triad um, who created the language that's now in the 2021 yeah. plumbing code. That and uh, is an organizing activist group that was a lawyer, um, a trans scholar and an architect. Yeah. So the, the, we worked with them for the new health center building, and there are going to be multi stall all gender restrooms, assuming that the plumbing code goes the way that it needs to go in order to that. The backup plan, if the plumbing code doesn't work the way that we want to, is that they're built so that they can be converted very easily into gendered restrooms. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You, you can totally ask a question. So uh, two things. First, uh, an affirmation and, and then a question. So my workplace is um, on the Shadyside Hospital campus, and we have a bunch of single-seater bathrooms that used to just say restroom, and somebody recently changed the signs to say all-gender restrooms. So they were not gendered before, but they're, like, even more not gendered now. And I was <laughs> kind of saying to myself, did we just did we accomplish anything or was this just a little bit of theater but i think uh, your film pointed out that that that's an important signal for people that makes them feel welcome so um so i feel like i have a better understanding of that now and, and appreciation of that my question is um so with all the talk of new construction that you mentioned do you think it would be better to create a more single seater bathrooms or 
or multi-seater bathrooms and have everybody just get over their hangups? What what would what would feel better to people? I mean, I want to also say that this could be answered differently by each person That's in this no room. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. like what I can say is that you know sometimes the only restroom I have access to is a single stall restroom. And do you know how popular a single stall restroom is? It is the most popular restroom in any building. You know, like this restroom that I had to access, despite the fact that it was like literally hidden and like you know in the basement of Syert and like locked part time of the day, it was occupied every time I went. And, and that's because everyone benefits from privacy. And, and you know, like the design for a, a, a all gender multi-stall restroom is more private. And, you know, I'd like to think that that's because that's what we all want, not because everyone's scared of trans people. Um, you know, I, I will share that like in some of these meetings, people have brought up really transphobic things and like scary stories about how many like perverts will be in the bathrooms all of a sudden and I'm just like you know like wor worries about pedophiles cruising the restrooms of CMU and I'm just like they're really bad at being pedophiles if they come to a university <laughs> that's like 18 and up but you know <laughs> like I guess like they're bad at it I, I don't know they're so. right uh, generally if you're gonna if you survey people people will be like well the option to have a single a single room to go into, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. You know, yes. no one will say no to that. Work from home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that is something that gets brought up a lot when we're like, well, you use the bathroom in your home, don't you? And there's many genders in your home, aren't there? What's the problem when you leave home? Why are, why does it, what, what's that? Uh, and, then, and then the other thing I'll say is that uh, the thing that's important is that, or th another thing that's important is that the door go all the way to the, to the floor. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I am, when I use whatever room I'm using, pe when people come to look to see if it's occupied, I'm concerned about the direction of my feet. Yeah. And in depending on the bathroom I'm in. Yeah. And it just is a tell. Yeah. Um, and I don't love waiting and having, it's really difficult to be in that, probably others have experienced this, when you're in the men's room and you're waiting and there's urinals yeah. and then they're like, go ahead. And you're like, right. not gonna happen. <laughs> yep. um, but I'll use the stall yeah. and then just waiting for the stall and then uh, yeah. just that extra time. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but so I guess my point is, if the door goes to the floor and then there's a clear indicator that it's occupied, that really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know, yes, that that awkward like, no, you use the urinal <laughs> moment is always They're disgusting. like, I'm yeah. like, I need privacy, please. You know, um, that is an awkward moment. And there's like a whole choreography to like how to access restrooms. And there's literally a designed gap in stalls. But it's That's fancy, not. Fancy hotels, right? They have a bathroom that has floor to ceiling. Yep. Do you know what I'm talking yes. about? Yes. Some, like, some fancy resorty places. So why does not CMU do that? <laughs> Olive Garden, where they have it. Olive, Olive Garden? Garden. The best thing about Olive, Olive Garden. Garden. <laughs> Need a good restroom? Olive Garden. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Do people, uh, when you go to a restaurant, I think it's, I don't know what the, Yelp maybe, do, do people look at, uh, because it does say all gender bathrooms, does people look at that when they go to a restaurant or anything? I I, well, so here's a complication here in Allegheny County is that any place that has all gender restrooms is breaking the plumbing code. Oh, that is so messy. All of them. And, and so, you know, all these wonderful places that have all gender restrooms, those small business owners put them in after the inspection. Um, and they're doing that by choice. Uh, yes, they have a, you know, inspector come. If, they, if they're the ones who did the construction or did any kind of renovation, if they got like, if it was like a turnkey situation, maybe they didn't. But um, yeah, you can't even have single stall restrooms. I mean, there's some slight changes right now um, towards more all-gender restroom access, but um, 
it, it, it's mostly not to code right now. Medical is different. Oh. Medical has different um, and and more lenient and you know because because just like I mean the other tie-in that I thought was really important was around um, disability yep, and accessibility around restrooms and and how these two things are very tied together and I can say from my own experience the first place I was sent here when I was like, hey, I don't have restroom access, was to um, the Office of Disability in order to accommodate me. Um, and, and I was like, this is kind of weird, you know? Like, I, I, it isn't an access issue. I can physically access these restrooms, and I can physically use the things in them as designed. Like, my body does that, but I'm, I'm being treated as though my body does not do that. Um, and and it's only because of you know the perception of my body as being like kind of this mystery gender, <laughs> you know. And I'm like it is a mystery gender, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that tie-in is is a literal one for medical places where I mean think about it when you're at um, a doctor's office like there's so many bathrooms. In, in, in the office, like in the places where you go and see the doctor. I don't have much medical language, so I'm like, the place behind the reception door. <laughs> um, there's a lot of all gender single stall restrooms. Yeah, so hospitals have a lot. Hema. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, yeah, what are your thoughts on like, I don't know, uh, like locker rooms? I know those touched on in the, in the documentary, because there's like, you know, like, will my nudity be sexualized if it comes all all gendered, right? Yeah. Like, versus like not. But like, I don't know. Like, I'm I'm I don't want to like be offensive or anything. I'm just like curious. Yeah, I mean, I I will just say like one of my experiences with going to like queer autonomous spaces and like you know queer option things like that. Like, I I guess I got to experience my nudity not being sexualized. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I don't think nudity means sex. Okay, yeah. But I do think that locker rooms and being nude and you know having scars or not having things or having other things um, does make somebody vulnerable in these gendered spaces. You know, um, I'm gonna go back up to Tara because I feel weird just standing and making you all turn. Um, but I also want want that to be asked to the group too, if there's any. Yeah, I'm curious about what other feelings. people think. And similar to Nika, I've spent a lot of time with my clothes off with queer people in spaces and it does, it. that's not what it's about. And I don't, it's actually quite beautiful to see lots of different bodies. Mm -hmm. um, it's celebratory. Um, it's easy. It's easy. Uh, oh. Yeah, it just feels easy all of a How sudden. How many people have been, I mean, I don't, I was a competitive swimmer. I can't swim anymore, you know? I, 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 I won't was too. swim. You were? Yeah. I was water polo. Oh, I'm a yeah. butterfly. Oh. Gonna, yeah. yeah. I mean, I still use a locker room. I used a locker room today. And I go to my Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. And my coach knows how I identify, and when he, re, he, he moved the gym and he built a new gym, and he really tried to make an all gender, like single stall option, and he you know, ran out of space because of the needs, according to code, to like have this space. Like he wasn't gonna have like a wrestling mat for us. Like, and he was like, he, he you know, walked me through it the whole time and he was really frustrated and he was like, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't afford to do this. And, um, and he's like, oh, we'll do it in the next space. And, you know, and he was like, tell me how to figure out the plumbing code, you know? And so like, we have binary gendered locker rooms. Um, I, I choose to use one of them and I just use that one and nobody cares because it's like the same people that I see all the time all, everywhere. Um, but one thing I do really love and was actually a really hard space for, is still a hard space for me, are Korean um, bathhouses. I was gonna bring it up. Spa Castle. Spa Castle. Oh, damn it. They even make you wear like but a I go. specific color. 
Yeah. And I've I, had... I go and I put a towel over my chest and I still get looks. Like, there's, just, I'm like, pretend there's boobs under that towel, everybody. And then, and there aren't. And it doesn't seem like there are. So, you know, I get looks. I have, I have been But I don't care. It's, but that's but they do sometimes, yes, friends have been kicked out. I haven't been kicked out yet. I've been cornered, and people say, you're a man, you're a man. And I was like, whoa, you can't get, it's so hard to access the spots, like through a maze after you check in and they give you color-coded clothes for what you're... And then it's the naked parts are gendered. And, and there's no other way in unless maybe you take an employee entrance, but I think that's even through gendered spaces. Yeah. So it's those, and it's, you don't, ex, it's always when you don't expect it that something will happen. Yeah. And um, it's nice to have canned responses. Yeah. Or so I'm just like, I'm in the correct bathroom, thank you. That just like a yeah. very quick and to the point um, rehearsal. Yeah. Um, but it's also making sure that you're safe in those spaces and not like not being able to go alone is so infantilizing yeah, that's and that's fucking sucks yeah that part so um you know it's yeah but the but the being cornered um yeah and not having anybody there to protect yeah. you or to respond and to be like okay what do I say to you? We're both naked right now. <laughs> I'm drop this t- what are we going to do? We're naked. <laughs> I'm going to win. If we're going to do me. something, I'm winning. <laughs> I haven't been on a wrestling mat in a minute, but I can throw down. But you don't want to. You're there I to don't relax. Do that. Yeah. You're there to take your mind off. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I heard that there were stickers going up. Is that, is anyone... Want to talk? <laughs> we won't talk about stickers here. Okay. But, you know, I, we do have stickers that well, you brought I did. that I wanted to hand Wait, out. Wait, can I? Is it? Do we have like three? Do we, I have like a. Uh, okay. So when I heard about what was happening here, which we won't talk about, I was well, like, oh. Well, what we can talk about is that there are some buildings that have um, all gender restrooms and restroom access, and there are some buildings that do not. And it, it's literally being described as. A bathroom desert. Oh yeah, and Tara has some more visuals for us. Um, quick. Yeah, and and that we've put up signs that say the bathrooms are for everyone, and they're getting vandalized, and and those signs are getting vandalized and not being replaced, and there's just like um, some priorities being communicated across the university, um, and so we have these stickers, we have more stickers at the door that are like trans positive stickers, there's Tina stickers, we have tons of stickers. I'm up. Love stickers. Don't look at my, don't even, close your eyes. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, if we have. I'm ready. Okay. Do you have an. That was going to be my question is the preferred uh, signage. Preferred signage. I mean, oh, that's oh, also no, another no, many no. answers. Because yeah. I Oh, cool. Oh, welcome. Thank you for supporting tonight. Thank you. And um, my husband, I brought him along because we've been really working for years and years in my old office. And it's amazing, after I left, they finally changed those signs because even though they were single gendered, they had the little man and the little woman. So Mm -hmm. stick figures. Yeah. So trans patients of mine said, nice, they're single, but I still don't feel welcome. Yeah. We've discussed putting an image of the fixtures that are inside of the restroom, and rather than describing who should be going in, explain what's inside. And so the other aspect that we've discussed is just like, what if we slowly moved away from saying all gender to just saying restroom, you know, and then we can move to single restroom, single stall restroom to multi stall restroom, and just like, you know, slowly move away from this like gendered space concept. That's what my big question was because it almost seems like why do we have to point that out? This mm-hmm. is just a place to be or yeah. to collect the samples in our yeah. place. But you know, I think there's some smarter ways to design restrooms, like quick restroom, slow restroom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Take your time space. <laughs> you know, relax. Sauna. Sauna restroom. Sauna restroom. But 
We, Nap oh, restroom. Yeah. Oh, I just had a comment to add to that, which is that um, one of the things that we noticed happening here when we started talking more about all gender signs is that like, or all gender restrooms other is like, that's when people started coming up with these like really weird transphobic comments and behavior and like bathroom, like more bathroom policing that I was hearing yeah. about where like random people using the bathroom where you're like getting more weird looks. And like, because like once you start describing the gendered or all gendered aspect of bathrooms, then like everybody starts thinking about that more, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I think about bathrooms all the time just because I have to use them. But like people who aren't trans then start thinking about trans people in the bathrooms. And then that just brings up all sorts of weird stuff. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like I think that's part of the shift from like, OK, let's just stop saying all gender restrooms and just say it's a restroom and say what's in it mm -hmm. and like not reference all gender, which starts turning into a thing that gets like, you know, right wing Republicans all fired up about like when the plumbing code goes through and like it just starts becoming like yeah. a way in which like transphobic legislation starts getting pushed so like once there's more attention on that then like there's more pushback i don't know i don't have a good answer for that but yeah. that's just like that's what i see so yeah and, and and just to elaborate on that we've literally been advised like let's just like quietly watch and see if the entire 2021 plumbing code gets ad adopted and then if it this certain section that is literally like four sentences doesn't end up in the thing that goes to the state health department, you know, then we'll start agitating and making noise. But if it just goes quietly and nobody notices, then that's good because we don't want to assign transness to this, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so there's been conversations like, how do we not assign transness to this? And it, I mean, it's absurd, you know? But I, I will also, also something that's come out of our conversations, and you know, there are many people in this room who have done a hell of a lot of work on this, by the way. Um, but um, just to s speak these things into the room, not as the authoritative person, but in conversation with the CMU police um, around what do they do when they're called to go to the restroom? And um, we had two experiences, one of which was we emailed like the head of the cops or something, somebody, and they're like, there's no reports of ever being, ever responding to these types of calls. Um, I, I, you know, I, some of us spoke to a police officer directly and he told us stories, you know, like, and, and that wasn't written down. You know, like it wasn't written that this person was trans or gender non-conforming, you know, like that, that part of it wasn't deemed appropriate or necessary or reportable. And so that means that like the fact that cops have been responding to people calling, this person has two, shoes are too big in this room. This, you know, this person is making me uncomfortable in here because they seem like X gender we're not being recorded. And so, you know, that then made, you know, it, like there's a lot of gaslighting in all of this work where it's like, well, that isn't happening. You know, pff, not on my book. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Whereas it is happening. And it's just like transness isn't spoken about, isn't written about. And literally sometimes our strategies are to not say that something would help us because we're in such a transphobic time right now.